This is Dimitri Lascaris reporting for the Real News Network from Toronto, Canada. The rich get richer and the poor, well, they get climate change impacts. That, in a nutshell, is the conclusion of a new study by researchers at Stanford University. Entitled Global Warming Has Increased Global Economic Inequality, it points to half a century of country-by-country -country global temperature data overlaid with GDP data for those same countries. The countries with the highest GDP, the study concludes, have more temperate climates and have in turn experienced less severe climate impacts while consuming the bulk of the world's fossil fuel resources. The opposite is true of countries with lower GDP. It's increasingly understood that climate change will impact working class people of color around the world first and foremost. That even though they did the least to cause the climate crisis. But the new study enshrines the notion and backs it up with decades of fresh data. Here to discuss that data is none other than the report's lead author, Noah Diffenbaugh. He is the Kara J. Foundation Professor at Kimmelman Family Senior Fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford University. His research focuses on how climate change could impact agriculture, water resources, and human health. Among other accolades, he has served as a lead author for the Working Group 2 of the Internet Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and he joins us today from Stanford, California. Thank you for coming on to The Real News, Professor Diffenbaugh. My pleasure. So your article, uh, Professor, was co-written with Stanford Professor Marshall Burke. In simple terms, what did you two determine to be the big picture takeaways from the research you did? It, it, what does it add to the body of knowledge on these interwoven topics of global climate change impacts? Well, what we found is that uh, the global warming that's already happened historically, uh, that's about one degree Celsius of global warming to date. But that global warming has uh, uh, overall uh, reduced the uh, per capita GDP in a large uh, swath of countries in the tropics and subtropics. These countries are uh, warm or hot, and that's the um, primary reason that they've experienced these uh, negative impacts from global warming. Uh, but they also, uh, in many cases, have low per capita GDP, uh, in many cases have large populations, and uh, in, in most cases have contributed relatively little to the uh, historical greenhouse gas emissions that have caused global warming. So overall, the net effect is that uh, you know, we find robust results uh, to indicate that, that global warming has already uh, reduced incomes in uh, many poor countries, and that even though uh, inequality between the richest and poorest countries uh, has decreased overall uh, over the last half century or so, uh, global warming has slowed the rate of, of, of the, um, that progress. Now, in your study, you talk about the parabola effect taking place in terms of temperatures in countries around the world and their GDP. Uh, for those who have not taken a geometry class for a while, what do you mean in this context by the parabola effect? Well, so uh, my co-author Marshall Burke has led work over the last several years to uh, understand uh, and isolate how temperature fluctuations in different countries around the world affect their uh, growth in, in GDP, their economic growth, year by year. And so uh, controlling for other factors, looking country by country, what they find is that uh, overall, uh, colder countries uh, such as Norway have um, uh, experienced uh, a bit faster economic growth in years that are uh, warmer than normal for Norway. Uh, and on the other end of the temperature range, uh, hot countries like India have experienced um, a bit slower economic growth in uh, the years that are warmer than normal for India. And so overall, there is kind of this hill-shaped function where uh, cooler countries have tended to benefit historically in, in warm years. Uh, warmer countries uh, have tended to, to have a drag on their economic growth in warm years. And then in the middle, there's a, a, ma a mathematical optimum um, in this relationship. And the largest economies in the world, the US, China, and Japan, uh, are, are right near that temperature optimum. In the short-lived sci-fi show incorporated uh, a dystopian society which chronicled the combination of corporate power and climate impacts. Uh, 
uh, from the vantage point of the year 2074, uh, a huge chunk of the world's population flocks to Milwaukee, Wisconsin as climate refugees. Uh, your, paper, your paper does not get into the refugee discussion, uh, but do you think the data drawn out within your research explains an impetus for why an ice cold place like Milwaukee could prove an attractive destination a few generations from now? You're, and you specifically mentioned the case of Norway uh, in your prior answer, and I know that you, uh, you deal with Norway as a key case study in your paper. What do you envision uh, is going to happen in terms of these colder climate countries becoming more attractive to increasingly desperate climate refugees? Um, well, so there is there is empirical research using a similar framework to what we've used uh, by other researchers um, asking that question about migration, and and uh, this is work by Will from Schlenker at uh, professor at Columbia University, and in that work they've they've analyzed historical records of asylum claims um, in Europe, and have linked back the you know, where the, the asylum claims at the destination country where the which country those those migrants were um, leaving and then what were the climate conditions in in those countries that the that the migrants uh, left and they've have found a, a robust um, increase in that migration during uh, during hot years in the in the um, country of departure, uh, controlling for other factors. So they've used a very similar econometric framework as what we've used in this paper, and, but have specifically asked the question that you're asking in terms of whether or not there's a contribution of uh, climate shocks, uh, climate conditions to to migration. And, and th their results suggest that there has been historically, at least for uh, European asylum claims. And lastly, what do you hope your study achieves in the broader discourse about climate change solutions uh, in arenas like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? Uh, and, and why did you choose to release uh, the paper on an open source basis? Uh, so those are two questions. Um, you know, in terms of the policy uh, relevance, there are a couple of results that are, that are relevant for ongoing policy discussions. Um, as you mentioned earlier, it, it has been discussed for, for many, many years by many, many people, uh, researchers, policymakers, uh, treaty negotiators within the UN climate treaty uh, framework. Um, you know, it, it's been observed for, for a long time that the, the populations and countries that are most vulnerable to climate change uh, in general have, have uh, contributed relatively little to the total global greenhouse gas emissions that, that are causing global warming. Uh, we, you know, what's new about our paper is that we provide country by country estimates of the impact of that historical global warming on uh, the economic uh, outcomes um, at the aggregate level for, for each country. So I think that prior to our paper, if someone was making that statement about the asymmetry between um, vulnerability to climate change and, and uh, responsibility for the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, they would have been hard pressed to provide quantitative figures, quantitative numbers of what that what the magnitude of that disparity has been. And our paper provides uh, provides that um, that quantification. Right, and, and I realize I did ask you two questions. The, the latter being, why did you choose to release the paper on an open source basis? Uh, we're, um, you know, our research is, uh, is, uh, relevant for, for, uh, the scientific community. It's relevant for policymakers. Um, you know, overall, you know, my research program has been funded. Um, you know, I've been a, I've been a principal investigator for the past, for more than 15 years, um, both at a public university, Purdue University, and now at Stanford at a uh, private university. And at both of those universities as principal investigator, I have uh, received federal funding to support um, my research program. I, you know, so it, you know, I certainly consider my responsibility to make the results uh, of my research program um, accessible to, to uh, the public. Well, we've been speaking to Professor Noah Diffenbaugh from Stanford University about a new study 
uh, regarding the relationship between global inequality and climate change impacts. Thank you very much for joining us today, Professor. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And this is Dimitri Lascaris reporting for The Real News Network.